so good morning everyone uh, welcome to this week's uh, iss it's my pleasure to uh, welcome abhishek gupta as today's speaker abhishek is uh, assistant professor at uh, ohio state university and has done some magnificent work on teams and games with uh, incomplete information and in recent years has been looking at a uh, rigorous theory for understanding convergence in reinforcement learning and he would be presenting some of that perspective today so without further ado abhishek welcome thanks a lot aditya for the kind introduction uh, so this is the joint work with uh, rahul jain at usc peter glenn at stanford and my students gaurav how and jian zong um, the uh, the the so what is recursive stochastic algorithm so this this term was basically coined around 1990s for um stochastic approximation algorithms so you know some other name for stochastic approximation algorithm but i really like the term because the idea here is you have algorithms where some sort of stochasticity is embedded within that algorithm like stochastic gradient descent or reinforcement learning and it's a recursive algorithm so the question there is uh, how do you study convergence of such a recursive stochastic algorithms and the perspective we are going to take here in in today's uh, meeting is a markov chain perspective uh, but there are other perspectives competing perspectives some of which i will talk about today uh, to understand the convergence properties of recursive recursive stochastic algorithms so to to begin the talk i want to recall a very very important result in a functional ana analysis called banach contraction mapping theorem and the theorem uh, is basically as follows so you have a contraction map t uh, so what's a contraction map well it satisfies this condition where the norm of tx1 minus tx2 is less than equal to alpha where alpha is some number between 0 and 1 multiplied by the norm between uh, x1 minus x2 so <clears throat> it turns out that if you recursively apply this operator t onto from any initial condition y not uh, you will eventually converge to x star which is a unique fixed point which is the unique fixed point of the operator t okay so this is just a pictorial demonstration of how this uh, recursive algorithm works or recursive mapping works and the proof of this is pretty straightforward what uh, what you need to show is that yk is a cauchy sequence and because the rn is complete or for that matter in any complete metric space um you can show that this cauchy sequence is going to converge and therefore it will have a fixed point x star and then there is some argument that allows you to prove that it is actually the only fixed point of the mapping t so this is pretty straightforward result i'm pretty sure anyone who has had some exposure to optimization or uh, markov decision problem or functional analysis has seen this uh, contraction mapping theorem before so let's look at some examples uh, as applied to optimization and mdps so i'm not going to look at examples outside of these two domains in this talk but certainly the ideas embedded in this talk as well as uh, ideas related to contraction mapping theorem are found across different domains within uh, the field of mathematics and applied mathematics so let's look at the problem of gradient descent for convex functions strongly convex functions so let's say i want to minimize a uh, function f of x uh, where x is some euclidean space with some norm and let's say our function is essentially a sum of uh, various strongly convex functions uh and assume that x star denotes the optimal solution for this particular optimization problem so we will assume that f is strongly convex and the gradient of the function f is lipschitz which means that the eigen values of the second derivative of the function at x is upper bounded by m and lower bounded by small m and of course small m is greater than 0 and uh, this is true for all x uh in the euclidean space so under this assumption uh, let's define this algorithm called gradient descent algorithm so what does this algorithm do at every point of time you look at the current iterate yk and you subtract the gradient of the function f evaluated at yk uh, multiplied by this step size parameter beta 
and then you subtract it from yk and that is the mapping the nonlinear mapping t of yk okay and uh, if it can be readily so shown that if beta is sufficiently small then t is a contraction map which implies that yk would converge to x star which is the optimal solution to this optimization problem so that's really great look at let's look at another example so we consider a markov decision problem with a, a state space s a action space a transition probability p cost function c and discount factor alpha between 0 and 1 and the goal is to find a policy pi that maps the state to action uh, and we want to minimize over all such policies uh, to minimize the expected discounted cost so this is the discounted cost over the infinite horizon uh, given that at every point of time t i'm going to pick a policy i'm going to pick my action according to this policy pi so how do we find this uh, optimal solution to this problem? Well, one of the uh, pretty famous algorithm to do this is called value iteration algorithm. So what does that algorithm does? So let's define a Bellman map. Uh, so in order to define Bellman map, we first have to set up the, uh, the space over which we will, uh, we will apply this Bellman map. So let's say V is the space, which is the space of all functions v from the state space to real real number and we will endow this particular space with in with soup norm or infinity norm and i'm going to define t which is the bellman map from v to v according to this fashion so this is a minimum over uh, all action the cost function plus alpha which is the discount factor transition probability multiplied by the value function v and this is my tv evaluated at state s so now the value iteration algorithm is iterative application of this bellman map over the space of value functions and the result is because alpha is less than one this t is a contraction map uh, over the space of value functions with endowed with the soup norm and as a result you can show that this iteration converges to v star which is the optimal value function and then pi star which is the optimal policy can be computed uh, by plugging in v star here and then taking argument over all the action so that leads us to the optimal policy and that's the optimal policy for this uh, um, markov decision problem and it can also be shown that v star is bounded so the soup norm of v star is uh, bounded by some constant which depends on the cost function and the discount factor alpha okay so i'm pretty sure uh, many people in the audience are familiar with this uh, and if you have taken aditya's course on stochastic uh, uh, optimal control then this is the bread and butter in that particular course so um, so these are not the only two situations where contraction map appears uh, in order to show convergence of uh, optimization algorithm to the optimal point. So if you look at stochastic shortest path problems and particularly value iteration for stochastic shortest path problem or Q-learning for stochastic shortest path problems, uh, those are all uh, contraction mapping argument under some assumptions. Uh, similarly, Q-value iteration also uh, the proof of convergence of Q-value iteration also follows a contraction mapping argument. Uh, average cost MDP with unichain uh, uh, assumption and with some other uh, assumptions, you can show that it's also a contraction map over some quotient space. Um, so it's it's a pretty technical result, but nonetheless, it can the argument there also comes from contraction mapping theorem. Then Markov games with discounted reward, primal dual optimization algorithms, ADMM, monotone operators, variational inequalities, and so on. You have a whole bunch of algorithms. The proofs of convergence of all those algorithms follows the contraction mapping theorem. So you set up, you set up the space over which you are applying the map. You show that the map is contraction, and then the proof of convergence to the optimal point is pretty straightforward. And doesn't require much effort because you leverage the entire tools and functional analysis to uh, to do that. And what is what is cool is uh, it it's not just a finite state space setting that you can solve. Like even infinite state space setting or uh, continuous state space setting, you can you just use contraction mapping and you get the results for all these different problems. So 
it works all the way from finite dimensional spaces to infinite dimensional spaces. So let's come to the discussion on stochastic recursive algorithm. So remember that in order to compute yk plus one, we have to apply this operator t uh, k times to, or k plus one times to y zero. But in data-driven algorithms, you, you have a lot of data, uh, but T is in general very difficult to evaluate because you'll have to use the entire data set or uh, you probably may not even have the entire data set at your disposal. So, so in those situations, uh, you probably will not be able to evaluate T at all at any point. So the idea there is uh, let's approximate T with some random operator. And I'm going to denote this random operator with t hat and k. So k is the time index or the iteration index at which the random operator is applied. And n is the number of samples used for, uh, for defining that random operator. And this leads to uh, what is known as a stochastic recursive algorithm. Uh, so at every point of time, you start with some initial condition you apply the random map at time zero, then time one, time two, all the way up to time k, and then you get your uh, sequence, a random sequence, uh, z hat and k. So here n may be the number of samples, number of basis functions, or some other uh, uh, index, which could go to infinity. Uh, so there are two things that can go to infinity here. One is the iteration index k, and one is the number of samples you're using at every point of time uh, to, to approximate the random, uh, approximate the exact operator t. Okay, so this is what is known as a stochastic recursive algorithm. So let's look at uh, some examples. So this is a stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So remember, uh, we had a large number of functions that we were adding in the definition of uh, our f of x. So my f of x was summation i equals one to n f i of x, uh, maybe one over capital N. Okay, so this is what my original function was. And let's say my capital N is of the order of 1 million or 1 billion. And so you may not be willing to evaluate 1 million gradients at every point of time because it may be too computationally challenging. So then what do you do? Well, you pick a small number. So this small N, so remember capital N is of the order of 10 raised to six, but small N could be of the order of 10 raised to three which is more manageable to, to, to evaluate. So you can evaluate a thousand gradients, but it's difficult to evaluate a million gradients at a time. And so what you do is you pick uh, some random, so n iid uh, functions, then you evaluate the gradient of those functions at z hat k, and you run the usual gradient descent algorithm with only these functions, and, and that defines a, a stochastic uh, operator, which is approximating the exact operator T. So what are the properties that we can glean from just looking at this operator T hat and K of Z hat K? So one thing we can, we can easily see is that if you look at the expected value of this uh, random operator evaluated at X, it is actually equal to the exact operator evaluated at X. So it's, it's an unbiased estimate. So this is known as unbiased estimate so t hat nk of x is an unbiased estimate of t of x. But the other thing that we can easily see is also that if you let n go to infinity, uh, this t hat nk evaluated at x actually converges uh, in probability to t of x. It could also converge in almost sure sense and uh, assuming some stronger conditions are satisfied. And the third thing you can uh, easily uh, also prove that if fi, each of these fi's are strongly convex with the same small m and capital M, then uh, t hat nk is a contraction operator, almost surely. So every realization of this random operator is actually a contraction operator with the same norm or under the same metric on the space. So at this point of time, is there any question on the description of stochastic gradient descent? Uh, I have a question. Um, yes. So the condition on fi uh, being strictly convex, uh, when we first uh, start the introduction, we say that uh, the uh, function f is uh, strongly convex. So this is a more stronger condition. 
Right. Uh, but typically, you know, if you look at some of the optimization or rather machine learning literature, they usually add a strongly convex regularizer to the mm -hmm. overall optimization problem, which implies that each of these FIs becomes strongly convex. I see. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. So let's move on to the second algorithm, which is uh, uh, the what is known as empirical Bellman map. So suppose you don't know the transition matrix P, but you have what is called a generative model, which means you can input S comma A, so a state action pair to that generative model, and it can give you N samples of the next state. So this is the next state. Uh, given the current state is S comma A, this is the samples of the next state, and you can get N such samples uh, from this uh, simulator or a generative model. Uh, so in computer science literature, it's called generative model. In other literature, it's called just a simulator. So it's the same thing. And so you get these N samples and then instead of doing the exact expectation, so remember this term was summation over S prime, P of S prime given S A V of S prime. So that was the term here, but because we can't, we don't know this particular term, but we can compute, we can get samples of S prime. Uh, what we will do is we'll just take the sample average approximation of the value function. So instead of computing expectation, we'll just take sample average approximation. And then we'll do the usual minimization over A and that defines my random operator at time K, which uh, acts on V hat K. So this is the definition of empirical Bellman map or empirical Bellman operator. And again, you can try to figure out what the properties of this uh, empirical Bellman map is. So in this case, we don't really have a unbiased estimate of T of V. So T hat NK of V, if you take the expected value, it's not equal to T of V. And the reason is this minimization term creates a problem. Uh, and that's why we can't get an equality here, which wasn't the case in the, um, in the other problem, which was the stochastic gradient descent problem. There was no minimization there. Now, but, but nonetheless, there is another constraint, uh, or another uh, property that this T hat NK satisfies, which is as N goes to infinity, T hat NKV converges to T of V under pretty mild condition because of the law of large numbers. And then uh, again, alpha is less than one because we are we have a discounted MDP. So every realization of this random operator is a contraction operator. Okay, so that's the, uh, so there are two, two conditions, uh, which is this particular condition and this condition, which is satisfied by both the stochastic gradient descent as well as the uh, empirical value iteration algorithm. So this is the empirical value iteration algorithm, E, V, I. <clears throat> so recursive stochastic algorithms is now pretty common in the machine learning literature as well as in reinforcement learning literature. Uh, I'm not very sure, but it, it may also be possible that other areas like differential equations or partial differential equations uh, solvers, even they may be using randomization to to uh, reduce the computational complexity of very large scale simulation, but I just have never done it. So I'm not very sure uh, of this claim, but uh, it could be possible that other areas also have similar uh, structure in, in the application of uh, algorithms. So within the field of uh, machine learning optimization and reinforcement learning, you have this whole bunch of different uh, recursive stochastic alg algorithms where you replace a contraction operator with a random version of the operator. And uh, it turns out that in all these cases, uh, these two conditions, which I talked about, which is, this is known as consistency and this is known as contraction. Both these properties are satisfied by uh, every realization of that uh, operator. And the goal of our research, uh, and this has been going on for the last five years, and it's still continuing. There are still some fundamental issues that we are addressing in this class of uh, such algorithms. The goal is to find a unified or come up with a unified framework to analyze all these algorithms under minimal assumptions. And so we'll 
I'm going to talk about some of our work on this topic in, in today's uh, talk. So what are the existing approaches for demonstrating convergence? So of course, this is a Markov chain, so you can't really get convergence uh, to a specific point, but what you can get is a con concentration bound. So perhaps uh, this Markov chain is going all over the place in the space, and then it gets to the optimal point and then is just doing a random walk around the optimal point. So that's the kind of result we would like to get, uh, the concentration result for such class of algorithms. So there are essentially two approaches uh, that are widely deployed for demonstrating convergence of such algorithms. And again, by convergence, I hear, I mean the concentration result, not necessarily convergence to a specific point. So if you look at the, the, the first method, which employs either ODE or super martingale approach, this is quite common in stochastic approximation algorithms literature. Uh, and it provides uh, asymptotic concentration guarantees, but it does not really extend to infinite dimensional spaces. So that's a drawback of uh, this ODE or super martingale approach. So I, I'm not even sure what would an ODE in a complete metric space would look like. So it just does not really extend to infinite dimensional spaces. And uh, that's a big drawback, in my opinion, of this ODE or super martingale approach. The second approach is the foster lyapunov approach, which is widely used in Markov chain uh, problems, where the goal is to construct a coercive Lyapunov function. So what, a, what is a coercive Lyapunov function? We would like B of X less than equal to C. So X such that B of X is less than equal to C. This needs to be a compact set for every real number C. Okay, and that's called a coercive function. So V is a coercive function if it satisfies this assumption. And uh, we need to construct a coercive Lyapunov function and then assuming that you can get negative drift and so on, uh, it can yield the existence of invariant measure, but it can't still get you the concentration result you want. So just because a Markov chain admits an invariant measure doesn't necessarily imply that there is a concentration around X star or the optimal solution, which is what we are interested in. So that is the third approach that we are trying to develop, which is, uh, which is actually not new approach. It's called iterated random operators approach. Uh, so it has been through a lot of uh, different names in the literature. So iterated random operators is, is uh, one name. Iterated function system is another name. Uh, so these are the two names that I have uh, I have encountered, but there are also perhaps other names used back in 1960s and 70s. So it's truly like something that was started in 60s and 70s um, to understand uh, uh, the usual regression algorithms. Uh, but then later on, it branched out to other areas of mathematics. And now we are bringing it back. We are trying to bring it back to the, uh, to the table for machine learning and reinforcement learning problems. So it turns out that if we look at the iterated random operators approach, we can get results, convergence result in infinite dimensional spaces without any problem. And as we will soon see, we don't really need the, to construct any coercive Lyapunov function. So, um, and, and also not, we don't quite care about the existence of invariant measure. What we care about is the concentration result and we will get the concentration result as well. So, it's just pretty uh, cool approach in my opinion for getting the concentration result all the way from finite dimensional spaces to infinite dimensional spaces. <clears throat> and uh, let's look at what are the basic ingredients for getting this convergence result. So we talked about the stochastic gradient descent and empirical value iteration. And these are the two operators which we had discussed. Um, what we realized in our through our discussion earlier is the first thing, every realization of this random operator is actually a contraction map. Um, so that's the first uh, common structure we have seen in those two algorithms. And the second common structure we had identified is that it has the consistency property, which means that as n goes to infinity, my t hat nk of evaluated at x converges to t of x with probability one. This is because of the law of large numbers. 
And it turns out that we'll actually need a somewhat weaker condition for the result that we would like to talk about or, or that we would prove in a, in a bit, which is we just require consistency at the optimal solution. So we require t hat nk of x star to converse to t of x star as n goes to infinity. So assuming that these two conditions are satisfied, this is what the main result of uh, the today's talk is, which is if X is a complete metric space, then these two assumptions <clears throat> plus some little extra, which is not really problematic assumption, uh, would imply the following. For large N, the limb soup over K goes to infinity. So as the iteration grows to infinity, my Z hat NK minus X star, the norm of it is greater than F, C, some C greater than zero is less than equal to delta. So we get concentration with high probability result, assuming N is sufficiently large and you run your uh, iterations for infinite number of steps. So any question at this point of time for? Um, so Abhishek, um, yeah. are you assuming that uh, the operator at uh, iteration k is independent across iteration? Or yes, these yes, can be sorry. Dependent? yes, yes, it is independent. It is independent. Sorry, I didn't mention it before, but they, these are independent across uh, k. So if I'm thinking of sort of variants of EVI where uh, say we have uh, a data set collected from real world experience right. and at every step we built up on that data set, can the methods that you are developing use to prove convergence of those types of like offline RL algorithms as well? Uh, no, actually that's the biggest drawback. So it requires regeneration, at least the theoretical part requires regeneration of sample at every point of time. Uh, I don't okay. have the practical experience in offline RL to comment whether these algorithms work well in those settings or not. Okay. Uh Thanks. So it requires a generative model. So you should be mm -hmm. able to get independent samples from the past. Okay. Yeah. So that is one of the drawbacks of this approach, which we are not able to address currently, which is how do you use important sampling so that you could reuse past samples um, at a future time step. So that is definitely useful for sample efficiency. And a lot of people have developed such algorithms in the past. But unfortunately, the current uh, state of random operator theory does not allow us to incorporate important sampling. But that is certainly one area that we are interested in and we are looking into it, but it, it, it's just a difficult topic to work on right now. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Sure, thanks a lot for this question. Any other <clears throat> question at this time? Okay. And sorry, uh, just for uh, clarification, you yeah. are not asking for unbiasedness no. of the operator. No, no. So in fact, we don't need unbiasedness. We need consistent consistency only at X star. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So three questions that we will address in uh, today's talk. Uh, the first one is the concentration result that we just talked about. Uh, the second result we will talk about is uh, convergence of trajectory, um, which is also a pretty cool. Uh, 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 it has a pretty cool interpretation, which I'll talk about. So as n goes to infinity, how, how does this entire trajectory converge to the trajectory of the original operator? And then we'll talk about variance reduced version of these algorithms. <clears throat> So let's look at uh, probabilistic contraction analysis. So we call it the uh, probabilistic contraction analysis uh, approach. Uh, so which is parallel to the foster Lyapunov approach and the uh, 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 ODE or su super martingale approach. So here is a picture. So this is my complete metric space X. And I start with some initial condition. And if I apply the, so this is my X naught. Uh, so I'm starting with the same initial condition as I would uh, for a deterministic operator. And this green path is what I would take to converse to X star if I were using 
the exact operator t. But because we can't compute the exact operator t at every point of time, we will use uh, the random operator and we will go from this point to this point, this point, this point, this point, and so on. And then eventually we will sort of converge in this area and do a random walk. That's what we want to prove. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the error. So what we want to understand is how does the error evolve in uh, this particular problem? So I'm here is my iterate at time k. This is my iterate at time k plus one. So this is equal to z hat and k plus one. And this is my error at time k. This is my error at time k plus one. Okay, and I somehow want to bound this particular error given this error. Okay, so I'm going to use, there are two things that we have. One is the consistency at x star and the other one is contraction of, almost sure contraction of t hat n k. So let's use those two properties. So this is the contraction coefficient of uh, t hat n k, which gets multiplied to the error at, n, at time k. And then this is the residual term. So basically I want to bound this term and uh, this is less than equal to this term and this term. And uh, that's what we have here. So one is the alpha hat n times the error. And then the second one is the distance between t hat n and x star, t hat n at x star and x star. And in order to understand the convergence property of the error, we just need to understand how does, how to control this alpha hat and, and uh, this error term, the additional error term that is coming in. So here are the three assumptions we will make on, on the uh, random operator. So the first assumption is consistency at x star assumption. So I want my t hat n k minus t x star greater than epsilon as limit n goes to infinity should be equal to zero. And the way to prove it for infinite dimensional spaces is to use what is called empirical process theory. So if you were, if your x was finite dimensional, you would use Hoefding inequality or, or Azuma Hoefding bound or, or some such uh, concentration of measure result to show this, uh, uh, this assumption holds. But when you are infinite, infinite dimensional space, then you will typically use empirical process theory um, to show this particular concentration result uh, or consistency result. The second one is the contractive results. So of course, we talked about operators where the t hat, which is the random operator was almost sure contraction. But here we are being a bit more general. So we say that it is almost sure contraction with high probability. So as n goes to infinity, uh, this alpha hat n greater than one minus delta is equal to zero. So the limit is in the limit, it's equal to zero. And we want this uh, operator to be uh, non-expansive almost surely. And then this is the third extra result, uh, extra assumption we need, which is if I look at the difference between t hat n k x star and remember x star is the, is the fixed point of t. So this is actually equal to x star itself. So I want the difference to be bounded almost surely by some number W, okay? And typically, of course, the bound would, you know what the bound on X star is. Uh, so it probably is not very large and therefore the difference between them also cannot be very large, uh, almost surely. And so with this, these three assumptions, I can show that assuming N is sufficiently large, uh, which depends on all the different parameters, uh, I could show that the probability that the error is greater than C is less than equal to some number, which I'll talk about uh, in, in, a, in a bit. And the idea is as N goes to infinity, this P here will go to one, and therefore we will get the concentration result we need for N going to infinity. So if my number of samples is large, uh, I will be extremely close to X star eventually. So as k goes to infinity, I'll be close to x, x star. So that's the main result. Any questions so far? Uh, uh, Roland Malamy here. Uh, does n have to remain constant throughout? Could you vary n as you go along? 
you can vary n as you go along, but uh, the proof that we have written is for constant n, and the reason for that is because as we will we will see in a bit, uh, we the the this proof actually comes from constructing a Markov chain, and if you vary n, then that Markov chain will become a non-homogeneous Markov chain. Mm -hmm. And getting the concentration or the invariant distribution of a non-homogeneous Markov chain is, is I mean, uh, so a non-homogeneous Markov chain may not even have an invariant distribution. So that becomes the big challenge. So okay. we keep n constant here, but with an implicit understanding that uh, you can vary n over as you move across the algorithm. It's just that the analysis of such an algorithm would be a nightmare. If one okay. happens to it, yeah. Okay, you could you could think of burying it early on and then eventually, Correct. you know, Correct. Uh, settle yeah. down. Okay. That's right. That's okay. right. That's right. That that's how I would think about it if I have to do an analysis. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Great question. So let's look at the. Uh, uh, proof of how we get to the result. It's just a two slide proof. So the idea is uh, we have a stochastic process, which is the error process. It's, it's a stochastic process. It's not a Markov chain, but we want to get the concentration result for this Markov chain. Sorry, this stochastic process. So what I'm going to do is construct a Markov chain, which stochastically dominates the error process. So what does stochastic dominance mean? Uh, it means that for every Q greater than zero and for all K in N, my probability that my error is larger than Q is upper bounded by the probability that the Markov chain is larger than Q. Okay, that's, that's just the basic idea of stochastic dominance. Um, and so how do we construct this, uh, this Markov chain R hat K? Let's look at it. So we fix C greater than zero, we pick epsilon and delta according to some, some uh, fashion. And we let eta be some value, which is two over delta. This is the ceiling function. So uh, smallest integer above two over delta. And uh, then we construct a Markov chain D hat K over the space of natural numbers uh, from zero to infinity. And this is my epsilon, which is right here, defined right here. That is the epsilon that gets multiplied to this Markov chain. And what we can show is that the probability that error is larger than C is dominated by this because of the stochastic dominance uh, assumption, not assumption, but the construction. And then this, after some simplification, we can show that this probability is actually less than equal to the probability that this can, this Markov chain D hat K is greater than zero at every point of time K. So the probability C here is uh, some lower bound on this particular result, uh, sorry, this particular probability. So probability that the contraction coefficient is less than equal to one minus Delta and that T hat N X star minus T X star is less than equal to epsilon. Um, this P can be made as high as possible by picking an N sufficiently large. And I'm going to let W bar be some integer greater than or equal to W over epsilon. And now this gives me the construction for D hat K. So this is the D hat K uh, Markov chain over the space of natural numbers that I was talking about in the previous slide. So the Markov chain does as follows. So this is this goes all the way to infinity. So this D hat K is over the entire space from zero, one, two, three, all the way to infinity. And it does as follows. So with probability P at any, at any uh, integer, let's say I pick an integer two. So with probability P, I go back one step. So I go to one. With probability one minus P, I go to two W bar. So remember this W bar is defined here. Okay, <clears throat> so zero goes back to zero with probability P and zero goes to W bar with probability one minus P. Then one all the way to W bar goes to two W bar with probability one minus P. Then W bar plus one to two W bar goes to three W bar with probability one minus P and so on. So it's a pretty uh, complicated construction or it looks complicated construction, but actually analyzing the invariant distribution for this uh, Markov chain is fairly simple. 
it's a tedious algebra but it can be done and what we get well assuming that p is sufficiently large you have a negative drift in this particular markov chain and it's a irreducible markov chain so it has an invariant distribution and the invariant distribution the result for probability dk equals to 0 is given by this expression so this p is defined here this w bar is of course defined here and uh, the probability is exactly this and using the lemma in the previous slide what we can show is that limit uh, lim soup as k goes to infinity that error is large is actually less than equal to probability that dk is greater than zero so i just have to subtract one minus this term on the right side and i get this particular concentration result now as n goes to infinity this p will go to one and we will get the concentration result where limit n goes to infinity lim soup of the error being large is equal to zero <clears throat> so that's the main result of our um, uh, recent paper so this paper is submitted to uh, psycon any question on this uh, construction of dominating markov chain Uh, I was just wondering if the irreducibility would be sufficient as n goes to infinity. Uh, normally the result, I guess the result we know for invariant measures uh, remain constrained by finiteness, no? Uh, uh, so negative I, over infinite state space, negative drift and irreducibility, so not infinite, but I'm, uh, maybe countable state space, Periodicity, yeah. irreducibility, and negative drift <clears throat> gives us the existence of invariant measure. Okay. Yeah. And we can show that this will have a negative drift assuming n is sufficiently large. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Abhishek, can yeah. this also be used to bound the error for large but finite uh, n rather than just uh, limb soup as uh, n goes to infinity? No, you mean k goes to infinity? No, uh, k goes to infinity, but n I keep fixed. Yeah, so this this is that this is the result for n fixed. I see. Okay. So p depends on n. So this p depends on n. Okay. You know, p p is a function of epsilon, delta, and n. So you can make epsilon and delta large, or whatever. You can make c large and appropriately pick epsilon and delta such that p is as high as possible. Okay. You, I think the other question you may be wondering about is what happens when k is finite? And, and that's a problem because for uncountable state space, uh, not uncountable, sorry, countable state space, it's not clear what the mixing time of the Markov chain is going to be. So I can't give a result for finite k, but I can give a result for finite n. I see. Yeah. <clears throat> so all you need for finite n, so this is the result on com incomplete metric space setting. So for finite n, you need to know what the value of p is, uh, this particular p, and this w bar is constant, so it just depends on w and epsilon. So as long as you know the value of p, you can just plug the value in here and you can get the concentration result. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and again, the way to get a, a, a bound this, this number P would be to use empirical process theory to get an appropriate value of N for this concentration to hold. And then uh, in most situation, you will have this with probability one because your T hat would be almost sure contraction. So you don't have to actually you can pick delta sufficiently small and you will still get this result. Mm -hmm. um, but if your alpha hat N is uh, not uh, strictly a, like contraction, then, then you may have to use uh, some other bounding technique to get a lower bound on the probability of alpha hat N being less than one minus delta. <clears throat> I see. Yeah. So the, this is this is the entire area where the concentration of measure is required. 
Um, and once you have appropriate concentration or measure result, you can get the value of P for the value of N you, you, you are picking. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Another question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe this is a stupid question. It just struck my mind. P is a probability that we measure, that we build, which is less than one. And W is a fixed number. Why epsilon can be taken as small as we want, right? Right. So um, normally this um, W bar is, is growing to infinity. So um, maybe I'm confused. Um, why is p to the power w bar um, not uh, not uh, di not uh, uh, converging to one? Oh, you said it converged to zero or one. So p would con so as n goes to infinity, p would converge to one, and this one minus one will be equal to zero. So this whole term on the right side will be zero as n goes to infinity. Oh, so the convergence happens at epsilon fixed. So I yeah, fixed for, for fixed, you, you fixed C and therefore everything else gets fixed. So delta and epsilon and all the other things get fixed. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you make C smaller, of course, your N is going to blow up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, maybe another question then um, that I had like that. Um, this, um, the two conditions that you have, I mean, there were three conditions here with the boundaries, right. but there are two main conditions. Right. Which, um, which like uh, you, there is like a contraction term, which is like a stability result right. and a consistency condition. Right. There is something called lax milgram theorem, which tells you something like it, when you, in convergence of um, finite, uh, finite difference methods, which tells you that whenever uh, you have stability and consistency of the scheme, you have convergence. Right. So, Wondering if this if this technique is related to that in some way or not or not at all. So I think you have got it right. So you there is stability because of uh, this, and uh, there is consistency because of this. And what we are basically saying is, as long as you have stability and consistency at x star, you have the concentration around x star. Okay. That's yeah. the main, actually, I like this message. So stability plus consistency gives you concentration. That's pretty much, yes, I, I do agree that this is, there is a bounded difference assumption, but I don't seem to uh, find a situation where this condition will not hold. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Great. So let's look at uh, an application of empirical value iteration to Lipschitz MDP. Uh, so Lipschitz MDP basically says that if your cost function is Lipschitz continuous, and if your transition kernel has some Lipschitz continuity property uh, with respect to uh, uh, Wasserstein distance, then, uh, then your value function V star is going to be a Lipschitz continuous function. So V star will be Lipschitz continuous. Okay, so this, this type of uh, algorithm, this kind of algorithm was actually studied in great detail in Munoz and Sepeshwari. I think this is an excellent paper to read. And uh, I would highly encourage anyone who's interested in empirical value iteration to actually go and read this paper. Um, I, I really love this paper. And uh, so anyway, so the, 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 uh, the idea here is you have an empirical operator, uh, you know, which is defined over all the states S. Uh, and now it could be an un it, it is an uncountable set of states s uh, and then you have a projection operator where what you do is you sample the states and you sample the corresponding value function and then you do some function fitting so project the uh, v tilde n to some appropriate function space and you get v hat n of k plus one okay so there is there are two steps involved in this class of problems one is the empirical evaluation and the other one is projection to a function space. So let's consider the Lipschitz MDP where V star is a Lipschitz continuous function and define my T hat NK, which is a composition of the projection operator at time K 
and the empirical operator at time k, empirical Bellman operator at time k. So if uh, the projection operator maps the measurable functions to Lipschitz function and is non-expansive in supnorm, and there are quite a few uh, uh, function approximating classes which satisfies this property, so it will map to a Lipschitz continuous function and it will be non-expansive in supnorm. Uh, so one is this condition and the second is consistency condition, which is as you let n go to infinity, uh, if you pick large number of samples of this, this function and you try to fit it at V star, um, you will basically get uh, the concentration bound. So, so, so the projection as n goes to infinity of V star minus V star should be close to epsilon with high probability for large, for n very large. So if these two conditions are satisfied, and again, there are ample number of function approximating classes which satisfies these two conditions, um, uh, particularly non-parametric function approximators, then, uh, then we will have the, uh, the error result that we need. That is, we had nk minus v star will be will be close to, which will be less than epsilon with high probability for n sufficiently large. Okay, so here n is being used two places, at two places. So you have n here, which is the empirical evaluation situation, and you have n here in the projection operator because you are picking n samples of the state in order to do the function fitting. So of course, these two n could be different, but then you can re-index the entire algorithm with respect to a single n. Um, and uh, and you can get the same result in that situation. Okay, so this result was of course proven in Munoz and Shepeshwari's paper uh, for exactly the same setting that I'm discussing. Uh, but, uh, but of course in our case, getting to this result was very easy because we just had to invoke our original result that we just proved. Whereas in their case, they had to come up with very complicated concentration bounds in order to prove this result. So we are able to get it with much less uh, um, uh, effort because of the fact that we have this big hammer uh, uh, with us uh, for solving such problems. Okay. So uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, seems uh, we have some time. Oh, actually, yeah. No, we don't have time. Sorry. <laughs> so maybe we are I'll... a bit. Uh, uh, I would mention in my email we are a bit lax about time. So if you need to go over a few minutes, that's okay. Oh, I see. Well, you know, uh, the second result. Let me go. Let me go over the rest of the result pretty quickly. It's not going to take much time. So the second result is as follows. So let's consider the problem of. So let's consider the problem of the exact trajectory, which is this trajectory and the random trajectory, which is this trajectory, okay? And the question that I, that I had always asked myself a uh, long time back is, uh, how does these two trajectories differ over the entire, like this K, uh, which is the iteration index? So let's look at an example, which is this example of stochastic gradient descent for logistic regression. So we are just doing classification between zero and one, given the image uh, using some, uh, logistic regression function. And let's consider this, uh, this stochastic gradient descent and the exact gradient descent. So remember T raised to K X naught equals to Y K. This is the exact gradient descent. And this is the stochastic gradient descent. And let's look at the difference, the two norm between the difference for all K. So this is K on the X axis and the two norm of the difference in the Y axis. And what do we observe? So there are two trends we observe as we increase the batch size. So first, for a fixed batch size, there is, there is this region and the error is always within this region. Well, with high probability. Okay, now what happens to this when I increase the batch size? Well, it's 0 0.4 here, 04 here, but it becomes 0 0.03 here. So the error is reducing as we increase the batch size at 0 0.02 here. So what, I, what we see is basically two things. First, the error is small with high probability throughout the iteration index K. That's number one. And number two, we see that as we increase the batch size, the error goes to 
zero. The error between the exact trajectory and the and the random trajectory or the Markov chain. So I was quite intrigued by this phenomena and I would see it in every talk and I didn't have a satisfactory explanation. So I started investigating what exactly is happening here. And we see the same thing with Poisson regression um, uh, and we have the same trend here. So it turns out that this result actually holds for infinite dimensional spaces, which is actually quite surprising. So, so what's the assumption here? So the assumption is, let's say your X is a complete metric space. Uh, we actually need it to be separable metric space. So it has to be Polish. Uh, we pick a compact set K in this set X and we pick a point X in that. So I want my T hat NK and T to be within epsilon uh, uh, with high probability. So that's this uh, assumption here. So for every compact set K, for epsilon delta greater than zero, there exists an N such that for all N greater than equal to N, the probability that T hat NKX and TX is far away is very, very small. So under this assumption, uh, let's consider mu N to be the distribution of the entire random trajectory and psi to be a Dirac mass over the exact trajectory. Uh, it can show that we can show that if X is a Polish space plus the assumption we made in the previous slide, which is satisfied again in a large class of learning algorithms, then mu n converges to psi in weak star topology. So this distribution over the entire trajectory converges to the Dirac mass over this y0, y1, and so on as n goes to infinity. The proof is basically coming from Carr in paper. So Alan Carr's paper in 1975. And what does this imply? It implies that if you look at the exact trajectory and you create an epsilon tube around this exact trajectory, it turns out that the random trajectory will be within this tube with high probability. So, and this radius epsilon will reduce as n increases. So that's what it means operationally, what it means for mu n to converse to psi in weak star topology as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this is, um, I just call it the tube result because it's easy to understand. So your entire random trajectory will be in tube with high probability. We see the same effect in empirical value iteration. So this is exact value VK and the empirical value Z hat NK. And for batch size N equals to one, the error is the epsilon is basically 40 or 50. And then when you take N equals to 25, the the radius epsilon of the tube becomes smaller, it becomes 20, and then for n equals to 400, it becomes 15. So we see the same trend um, for, for empirical value iteration as well, and, and also for the logistic regression. So that's the, uh, and it works for infinite dimensional spaces, for Polish spaces. And then the third uh, part of the talk is about variance reduced algorithm. So this is inspired by SVRG algorithm. So let's say I have a, uh, I have a random operator T hat that I can compute very easily. I have the exact operator T, but it requires a lot of effort to compute, but it can still be computed. Uh, how can we uh, improve the convergence of our algorithm? So here is the algorithm which was inspired by the famous uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithm called SVRG algorithm. Uh, so we define this uh, operator T bar, which takes two inputs. So the first input is of course the current iterate X, and this is, let's call X tilde as a proxy term. So what is X tilde? Let me go back. So we start with X zero, and then we of course take some steps. We reach X one and then we reset uh, x tilde one to be equal to this point, and then we run the algorithm with a fixed x tilde one, and then we go to x this point, and then we replace x tilde one with x tilde two, rerun the algorithm, and so on. So that's the overall idea. So it's an epoch-based algorithm. So at you have to pick epoch length m, and for a fixed x tilde p in epoch p, you run this algorithm from y hat k to, so y hat zero to y hat m. And once you reach y hat m, you replace x tilde p. So you update your, you go to epoch p plus one with x tilde p plus one equals to y hat m. So you reset your x tilde term after the end of every epoch with, with the last iterate. Okay, so this is 
the overall way this variance reduced algorithm works. And it turns out that uh, if you have these two conditions satisfied almost surely, and if alpha plus k is less than one, then you get convergence in probability as p goes to infinity. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a pretty general result. And this is the condition on the contractivity of t hat, and this is the condition on the contractivity of both t hat and t together. And these two conditions are satisfied would imply, so, so this is for fixed x tilde, t hat should be contraction. And if you replace x with x star, and you have x tilde here, then there has to be some other contraction coefficient uh, here in, in the description. And then you get the convergence in probability. So let's look at some specific values of beta naught and beta one. So we have beta one equals to one here. And here I'm going to replace this term beta naught by one minus Lipschitz coefficient of t over four times some upper bound on the Lipschitz coefficient of t hat. And it will give us this convergence in probability uh, as p goes to infinity. So this is the essential idea in variance reduced algorithms. Okay, and a slightly different technique would work for contraction operators over Hilbert space. So this is for uh, uh, complete metric spaces or uh, yeah, complete metric spaces. But for Hilbert spaces, you can come up with a better um, uh, values of beta naught and beta one. Uh, which will also have the same result, uh, convergence and probability. So, uh, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, basically, the main message of this talk was if you have a contraction co condition on the random operator and consistency at x star, uh, this would imply you will have concentration around x star. And this is in the generality of complete metric spaces. Uh, and the key takeaways is if you want to improve the performance of your recursive stochastic algorithm, you should pay a closer attention to t hat n and you want it to move x star very less. Uh, so less movement of x star under the influence of t hat is, would lead to better performance. And uh, no matter what algorithm you come up with, what recursive stochastic algorithm you come up with, you can come up with a variance reduced version of that algorithm pretty easily. And uh, right now we are working on removing the metric structure. Uh, so looking at divergence, more general divergence uh, functions uh, over the spaces. And we want to remove the contraction mapping assumption as well. And we'll see how far we can go with this sort of setup. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Abhishek, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we can take some questions. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to rush through the last part of the talk. But... Uh, thanks very much, Abhishek. That was uh, marvelous. Um, I, I, I wonder if you can, um, <clears throat> we have the convergence with N, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, in, in all the results. But I wondered if you could just give it, give some, are there estimates um, dependent on little n um, of the accuracy of the results or the rates of convergence on little n? Maybe you mentioned that, uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, so no, so I think there are, uh, there are two excellent points there. So the one is just the concentration result. So the concentration result is embedded in this expression uh, for a fixed n. Uh, but the other part, which is the rate of convergence result, that is actually a big problem uh, for, for countable state space Markov chain. So the issue with count countable state space Markov chain is you don't quite know how quickly you will converse to the invariant distribution. So you have, you know that eventually uh, there is an invariant distribution of this Markov chain and you will converse to that unique invariant measure. But how fast you will converse to that invariant measure is not known. Um, however, in, a, in the paper, we have a result that we assume if X is a bounded metric space, so X is bounded. In that case, you can actually get the convergence result for finite K as well, because, because in that situation, your dominating Markov chain is actually a finite state 
Markov chain because your X is bounded, so you can't go all the way to infinity. Uh, and and in that situation, there, the mixing time is well known for the Markov chain, and you can actually get the uh, convergence result for finite k as well. But the real issue is the uncountability, sorry, the countability of the Markov chain, the dominating Markov chain. That's the real problem that doesn't allow us to understand the rate of convergence to the optimal solution. Thanks, Peter, for this wonderful question. Um, so maybe I have, a, I have one more question. Sure. Um, there is this part of the talk, maybe the second part, where you are trying to approach to relate the closeness of paths. Right. And maybe there is an assumption. There's, yes, further. Yes, yeah. yeah. Backwards. Yeah. The tube, the tube one. The yeah. tube figure. Well. Figure? Okay. Yes. Okay. So there is maybe there is an assumption that I did not see and which is which is not clear to me. Why will it be that when I have the the exact operator T and that I'm running out the contraction algorithm the the Picard iteration, the iteration to converge, why will it be that the path is unique? Um, because I can start at at, at, at X zero, I run this iterations, I know that I will converge to the optimum X star, but right. I can converge with it with two different paths. Why will it be that I will converge with only one path? You're talking about the exact operator or? Yes, the exact operator. Yes, the Y, right. the y in line here. Yeah. Why will it be that the, the, I mean, close enough to X, I can see why the line should be unique. But if I'm further from X, X star, I can think, one can think of um, the, the line spreading out, spreading into two directions and cutting back again. Oh, uh, right. So, so this is a deterministic operator. So T is a deterministic operator from X to X. So okay. T cannot take two different paths. Uh, it has to, so if you fix the initial condition, why not? Then it has to take a unique part to X star because there is no uh, uncertainty anywhere in this entire process. So okay. the entire path is is well defined. So there is only only randomness in the in the T hats. That's correct. Okay. correct. 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 And Thank of course, you. this path can be can be quite different depending on the realization of the operators. Uh, but the essential result is this path will be around within this epsilon tube with high probability. So once in a while, it might go out of the tube, but then it will come back within the tube. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat>
Now, policy gradient, I am not quite sure if the exact operator of policy gradient, uh, looking at it, which maps a function to a function. So it has to be in the space of policy function space. So what is not clear to me is whether the exact operator is a contraction operator or not. But if, if you know, let's say you come back and say, here is the condition under which the policy gradient method, the exact policy gradient method is actually a contraction operator. I think then our approach will be very much applicable in that situation. <laughs> okay, there are in the original papers. I don't think the policy gradient uh, proof uh, uses any contraction theory argument, but some of the recent papers make an assumption that the gradient is has is Lipschitz and has a bounded Lipschitz constant, and use that to prove certain things, and that looks right. very similar to uh, sort of the first example that you had given for stochastic gradient descent. Right. So I think there are two two gradients, two Lipschitz conditions that you may that people may be talking about. So one is my J, which is or maybe value function V. So I have this value function V, which is a function of pi, which is my policy, right? So you can talk about two gradients. One is gradient with respect to policy pi of V pi, uh, and the other is my pi is parameterized by theta. So I am basically saying V of Pi theta, and I'm taking my gradient with respect to theta of pi theta. And I think uh, the, the Lipschitz condition you are uh, talking about is basically this is Lipschitz with respect to theta. But uh, mm -hmm. what, I, what I'm referring to is this particular, uh, so what I'm referring to is pi k plus one equals to pi k minus beta What I'm referring to is whether this map is a contraction map or not. I see. Yeah. So if this map is a contraction map, then you can apply our result without any problem. But but this one is is I think uh, it's not very. I mean I I know some results that have been proven in the recent past about policy gradient method, but. Uh, but but those are also those are all in the space of uh, parameters that defines the policy, but not the policy itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So this type of approach is actually called functional gradient descent in the machine learning literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I I I am I'm thinking about looking into these algorithms at some point of time uh, to understand these contraction properties in the space of policy functions. Okay. The, the real challenge there is to come up with the uh, metric over the space of policies, which will render these operators to be a contraction operator. So at this point of time, it's not clear to me what those uh, metrics should be on the space of policy functions. Mm -hmm. Um, may I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, on one of the assumptions on the projections, uh, I, I don't know where it is. Yes. Um, on the yeah. projection function pi. So in here, the unrepresented number of samples, right? right. But you also mentioned that they could represent uh, the number of base functions. They basis functions, yes, that's right. So in, does it apply to here when we think of base functions or this is um, this is right. only for, yeah so let's say you are looking into the reproducing kernel hilbert space function approximator right mm -hmm. so it turns out that if you look at rkhs there is a lot of like a large number of rkhs space that has this uh, universality property which means that it can uh, ap approximate any continuous and bounded function um, mm -hmm. as the number of basis functions goes to infinity, right? Mm -hmm. So you can let n be defined by both how many samples you use for fitting and how many basis functions you use for approximating the function V star, mm -hmm. right? And you can let n go to infinity for both these things together. 
So I, I pick large number of samples and then I, I pick large number of basis functions. And that will satisfy this consistency assumption that we require on the projection operator. See, thank you. W what is more important and what is problematic typically in these situations is not the second part, which is rather easy to prove because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because of Weierstrass approximation theorem. The real problem is basically proving that this pi hat n would be non-expansive in SUP norm or, or some other norm. Mm -hmm. So this uh, projection, I'm, I'm actually dealing with this problem for over a couple of weeks now where I'm just not able to understand whether projection in general would be non-expansive or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And, and if anyone knows a good reference on this topic, please do let me know because I've spent too much time proving this non-expansiveness in general settings. Any other questions? Uh, I, I was wondering if, uh, if the invariant measure approach would work if you could add Variance bounds, let's say, on that uh, on that uh, invariant measure. In other words, you 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 prove there exists an invariant measure, but then you try also to propagate the you know second order statistics or something like that. Would would that and and then ultimately use some kind of inequalities? Or, right, right. Uh, you know, it's an excellent idea. I never thought about it. Uh, but I'm sure we can do it. Uh, it it's, uh, I think it will require a different construction of this dominating Markov chain. Uh, but if we have the second, uh, you know, like maybe mean square error or something, some information about the mean square error, uh, we could use Markov's inequality to come up with yeah. a better dominating Markov chain and, and allow it to converge much faster, uh, at least in theory, like we, what do I mean by converge much faster? We can get a stochastic dominance argument saying that, look, we earlier said this is the convergence speed, but actually it's much faster than that mm -hmm. uh, because of the second order terms. But but yes, I think that's a great idea. I, I think we should try it at some point of time. It, it's, it can be done, I think, easily. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? All right, if not, then let's thank Abhishek once again for this really uh, wonderful talk. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Abhishek. Thanks. Thank thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Great. Hopefully, thanks, we'll thanks. meet in person at some point of time. Yeah. We all look forward to that. That's marvelous. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Aditya. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.